Anthony Sarah. Some medical researchers refer to it as the holy grail. It's the female Viagra or the idea of it. Would that really work for women? Well, last night, leading researchers from UBC and UVic met to discuss the medicalization of female sexuality and the profits that this issue could potentially bring to the pharmaceutical industry. Believe me, if you thought Viagra could make a lot of money, the female version of that could also make a lot of money. And I'm sure there are lots of pharmaceutical companies who are lining up to try to find something like this. Well, Lori Brado is with us, an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UBC. Lori, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show. So is this really something that pharmaceutical companies are actively looking for? Yeah, it's it's certainly there's been a race to find the equivalent of the female Viagra. Since Viagra was approved in Canada in 1999, a variety of different drug companies have been testing and uh, approaching the FDA, which is sort of the United the United States equivalent of the Canadian Health Canada, uh, with uh, with different products for approval. And to date, there still is not any product approved for any aspect of women's sexual response. Um, however, the race certainly continues because it, it is uh, a, an, an intense profit builder. Right. So I, what I'm, confuses me about this is that, you know, with my limited understanding of the sort of, you know, the biology behind this, don't we know that for women it's more psychological and less mechanical? Well, I think if you were to, to poll 10 women, um, very, very likely that all 10 women would say, well, yes, of course, this is sort of one of those no-brainers that it has much more to do with how a woman feels, how she feels in her own skin, her sense of attractiveness, how much she likes her partner, whether the kids are asleep, how much she's slept. Um, a whole host of factors will, will, in, will impact on whether she feels desire or not. But the reality is, is that we live in a culture and in an era where we want the quick fix. Um, we want to pop a pill for all of our ailments, um, and we see this in all different aspects of health. So even though the science has been telling us now for, for several years um, that there is no one biological, biological cause uh, for why a woman might have sexual difficulties, um, certainly, I think the, the, the profit to be had um, m- makes the, the race continue. Right. And what is this saying to women about how they're finding sexual fulfillment and enjoyment? Well, again, the message there is that uh, I- ignore your context, yeah. ignore whether you like your partner or not, just take a pill. And um, in one of my roles as a sex therapist, um, usually very, very early on in our work with couples, we, we spend a lot of time providing some of that really basic education, such as do you know how to communicate with each other? Do you know how to tell a partner what you like and what you don't like? Um, do you know where and how to evoke sexual pleasure, et cetera? And it's surprising that um, for, for a vast majority of the people that we do see, that some of those, what maybe some of us would think are the basics of sex education, really um, are, are still not there. But a lot of women are also shy, right? This comes down to shyness. Women don't feel comfortable talking about it. And do we have to have that labeled? Like, I know there's a push to label a lot of this sort of female sexual dysfunction. Yeah, and, and there is the danger in, in the label because unlike many other areas of medicine where we've got good markers, you know, you know that you have diabetes when your blood sugar falls within a certain range. In the area of sexuality, we don't have those objective markers where we can say, you know, if you're having less than uh, one episode a week, then, then you really do have a sexual dysfunction. So it really falls upon the individual to say, um, you know, I'm unhappy with this. This is really bothering me. This is really getting in the way of my life. Um, it's an entirely subjective experience. Um, so your earlier comment about, about the shyness, this, this is another big hole in medicine. Um, and our, our medical schools are unfortunately failing quite miserably at teaching young physicians on just how to talk to patients about sexuality. We know that the vast majority of, of family doctors simply don't ask their patients about the basics of, of their sexual response. Really? And why is that? Well, there's still a lingering taboo, even in 2012. Um, it's a difficult topic to talk about. And even if we feel like we have the sort of assertiveness to ask questions, we don't really know what to do with the information. So if someone says, yes, I've been having difficulties experiencing orgasm, for example, um, many doctors don't, don't know the next step, don't know where to make referrals, don't know what books to, re- to refer to, and uh, it can be quite an uncomfortable position to be in as a physician. But when women say that, that they're having difficulties, 
difficulty reaching orgasm. Do they, are they saying that because it is a mechanical problem or is it something that they need to talk about? Well, this is often the role of someone who, like a sex therapist or a sexual medicine physician who can take the time and actually ask a woman, and ideally her partner as well, um, about uh, the different aspects of her life, right down from the mechanics of how they engage in sexual activity, all the way out to how she feels about herself, her psychological well-being, and very often events in her earlier life related to her early development, early sex education, can, can uh, all impact how she experiences sexuality today. So because of the, the complexity, and, and I will add, it's not, it, it's not that uh, just women have this kind of complexity. Men, men do as well. Um, but because of the constraints of the typical 10-minute office visit, it's really not much time to get into some of those important details. Right. So what do you hear from women? I mean, you're a sex therapist. You must hear lots of stories from them. Yes, and, and I'm, I'm actually seeing a growing number of young women, so women working full-time with small children, juggling multiple different roles and responsibilities, um, sleeping very little, being very hard on themselves, um, and often coming into my office uh, asking, if not begging, you know, get, is there a pill for this that, that I can fix this? And when you look at her lifestyle, um, the fatigue, the often nutrition and fitness are, are out of line, um, it's, you, you see many different effects on her health, not only sexuality. It's almost no wonder that she wouldn't be interested in sex, which many people reserve for the very, very end of a long day. And I think that there is also this cultural myth that uh, desire is something that just lives within you, that no matter how you're feeling about yourself, that it will, it will be there. It's kind of like hunger. You know, no matter what kind of a day you had, the hunger builds and the hunger is there. And if the hunger isn't tended to, it will erupt. Well, sexual desire doesn't work that way. Sexual desire um, is sort of like friendship. It's something that emerges between two people. It's not something necessarily that lives within you. Right. Well, I have so much more to talk about with this, but we have to take a quick break. So stay with us. Don't go anywhere. We're talking about women and sexuality more when we come back. We're talking about women and sexuality. The pharmaceutical companies are very big on looking for some kind of female Viagra, and they hope to cash in just as much as they did on the male version of that. But is such a thing even realistic? Lisa Brado is with us, an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UBC. Thanks for staying with us, Lori. Hi, Lori. Uh, I'm... Oh, Hello? no, that's not Lori there. We've got Lori yeah, here, here, I believe. Here I am. <laughs> I'm right here. Hi, thanks for staying with us. <laughs> no problem. All right, so let's get back to our discussion here about women and sexuality. Now, one of the things I think we assume is that um, there's a point in your life where you kind of have to give that up for a while, right? When your mm -hmm. kids are small. We always hear, hear people say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a very important message that uh, I often counsel couples on that I see is that desire is one of those things that it's, it, it's going to wax and wane over the course of your lifetime. So whether it be because you have small children and you're, you're just simply exhausted or you're going through a particularly stressful period in your life or you're dealing with medical issues, um, uh, desire may, may dip a little bit. Just as we know there are other times in your life or in your context where desire might rise. So with Valentine's Day coming up around the corner, we know that that's a day that many couples anticipate, they look forward to, they plan and sexual encounters. And as a result, their desire, of course, is going to go up. Is that because there's a hormonal under, underpinning to it? Uh, well, pr probably not. It probably has much more to do with the anticipation. Right. And yet people complain about the expectation that Valentine's Day sometimes places on relationships. Right. And that's, and that's the flip side of the anticipation is the burden that, that uh, it also carries. Right. And so for women, it's, I think it's about, you know, if you ask them, they, they want to find the time to relax. They want to feel like they are important to somebody. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you give them a pill to feel all that. Well, that, that, and that's exactly the point, And that's precisely why um, several of the last medications uh, that have been tried in, in a number of large uh, high profile studies have not been found effective. In fact, in one of the most recent studies that was the result of a, a, a multi year, multi million program, which was um, a topical testosterone, in other words, a testosterone gel that women applied just to the surface of their skin. Uh, and the results were unleashed in December, 
and uh, the company itself was fairly certain, fairly optimistic that it, the, the uh, drug was going to be positive, that they would be able to go to the FDA for approval for this medication to treat women's low desire. And it turns out that in, in several of their um, measures, several of their endpoints, that the placebo group or the sugar pill group actually did better than the, than the medication group. Um, and, of course, to me, that's no surprise. Uh, you enroll a woman in any kind of study where she's expecting her sexuality to get better, and it probably will. Yeah, again, going back to the whole thing that we talked about, is that it is psychological for women. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I certainly don't want to simplify uh, because I think that there, there are conditions where medical health in general uh, does play a very, very important role, um, but it's never going to be as simple as, you know, it's just one gene, it's just one hormone, it's just one neurotransmitter, and that's certainly the angle that the drug companies are hoping for, that they will be able to find, you know, the, the misalignment within the woman's body that they can then correct. And yet, so this is not something that pharmaceutical companies are going to be giving up on anytime soon. I don't think so. I mean, we we heard recently that this particular company with the failed testosterone prod, uh, product that, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, taking stock, they're going back to the drawing board, and there's a lot at stake because, again, there has yet to be any product approved in North America for, for the treatment of women's sexual difficulties. Right, and uh, there's a lot of money to be made in this. Is that what the real, that what it really all comes down to, is that if, if there's some pharmaceutical company out there that thinks that they can somehow cure what they think is is female sexual dysfunction that there's a lot of money in that well and and again from the from the perspective of the drug companies that's ultimately what what this is about uh for those of us working in healthcare, uh what we want i think we all share the same goal and that is to have something that will help women uh, but those of us sort of in the trenches working with women and couples um quickly realize that that it, it um it's probably not going to be packaged up in a little pill Right. So then what do you tell women who come to you with concerns about their sexuality? So the first step is um, really has to be a really careful and detailed interview where you find out much more than just the women's the woman's main complaint. You find out who she is, how she defines herself. Ideally, we interview partners together with the woman as well as partners separately. Um, and we try and take a really kind of holistic view at, at coming to an understanding of why does she have this particular difficulty. Because from one woman to the next, the reasons behind her particular she- sexual difficulty w- could vary quite a bit. And then once we understand what are the key uh, players um, we can then take a take a forward moving direction. So in, within my own particular work, I do a lot in the area of mindfulness meditation, uh, cognitive and behavioral therapy, um, and uh, anxiety reduction and relaxation strategies. And so far, when you look at the scientific research that's looked at these particular approaches, they seem to be really quite helpful for for women as well as for for men as well. Interesting. So then what, what would you recommend to a woman who's listening to this? What would you recommend that she do? I think the first step is um, talk to a provider that um, will take the time and uh, give you the space to really kind of explore the many different areas of, of your life. Start with a family doctor. Um, if you feel like you don't get very far, ask for a referral, whether it's to a center that specializes in sexual health, to a sex therapist, uh, many gynecologists in the Vancouver area uh, are really quite good at this, but that's really the first step is trying to understand what is going on. There are also some some uh, very good books out there. Uh, I could recommend going down to chapters and just looking in the uh, the self help book section just to read a little bit more about again what are the different parts of my life and my background and my partner that mm-hmm. could be playing a role here. And most importantly, to know that they're not alone, right? Absolutely, yes. This is, uh, and th- and that's where some of the the relief comes from. Yeah. In our center, we run a large number of groups, and uh, women will unanimously say the enormous relief that they feel uh, just knowing that they're not alone. Right. Well, Lori, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks very much for having me again. That is Lori Brado, the associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UBC.